What's up, everybody? Jason and Joe here. Tastes like music. Arctic Monkeys Week. Uh, and if you missed our announcement on the community tab and in Patreon, Kramzer has left us. He has uh, decided to step away from the channel. He is uh, no longer going to be appearing in the videos. So the videos are going to be shorter. So I guess maybe that's good news. Maybe that's bad news for Arctic Monkeys. I think maybe it's good news. It seemed like he was not into it. <laughs> so I think I think Alex Turner finally just drove him mad. Drove him right off the program. Three years of work. Not worth it to finish the seven albums, the Arctic Monkeys. Uh, but the channel will continue. The show must go on. So, yeah, definitely not stopping, not slowing down. We're going to be doing all kinds of stuff to wrap up this year and then continue into the new year. Seven albums to rank for the Arctic Monkeys. Uh, I've heard all of them at some point, at least once, but I wouldn't say any of them were like ever records that I listened to a ton. So even though I've heard them, most of them I'm not that familiar with. How about you? Well, I really, I basically ignored them their entire existence. I remember hearing Bet You Look Good on the Dance Floor when it came out. I was like, yeah, lame. And I basically just, you know, I heard the AM stuff on the radio and I listened to that for album of the year. And I went back and listened to some of the albums, but nothing really ever like jumped out at me until last year when the car just took over and shot up to my number two on the whole year and kind of spurred a, a stronger interest in Alex Turner and the Arctic Monkeys. And I'm very glad that the Patreons decided to bless us with their discography. Despite it being pretty short, I uh, found a lot of stuff that I may have overlooked. So um, I, had, I had a good week. The opposite of Kramzer. I'm doubling down on the channel instead of quitting it after listening to Arctic Monkeys. Uh, that's good. I'm doubling down as well, but it has nothing to do with the Arctic Monkeys. Uh, who you, who should start? You sound like you're going to be pretty positive through this, so maybe I'll go first. All right. Not that I'm going to be super negative. Uh, I am more indifferent than negative feelings on this band. I think my list, though, is really weird um, compared to like the standard or what most people seem to think. Just from what I generally know about this band and then seeing some of the lists that people put together in our Discord. I am on another planet from most people. Uh, my list may, in fact, even be the complete opposite of a lot of people's. So uh, my number seven is whatever people say I am. That's what I'm not. The debut. I was not impressed with this at the time when it came out. It felt like just another overhyped band by the British music press. Coming back to it now, I think it has a good energy. And I think he's a, a pretty strong lyricist the entire time. And I think he's already pretty good here. He gets better as things go on. But the production is really flat. It's too uniform through every track. It kind of makes a lot of these songs just kind of blur together for me. As a result, I think if you take a track from this album, throw it on a playlist, it can provide like a nice little bolt of energy. Be like, yeah, that was cool. Glad I heard that song in this playlist. But listening to this album front to back is kind of an exhausting slog for me. By the end of the second track, you kind of get what they're doing and they don't give you really much else different. A couple slower songs like thrown in here and there, but... For the most part, the general sound, the arrangements, there's nothing that interesting happening aside from some of the lyrics are pretty cool, uh, but it's just not enough. There's other albums of theirs where I think the lyrics are super compelling and interesting, and that can be all I listen to. I can just focus on the lyrics and be like, this is great. I don't think the lyrics are that good. In the instance of this record, it's kind of like every once in a while you hear a little line or a couplet and you'll be like oh that was clever that was cool but yeah for me it's just I, I don't get the hype of this record it just sounds like a young band that's excited and going for it and that's cool but I think they get so much better as they go on and to me this is just the starting point and it only goes up from here um so three stars for whatever people say I am it's a respectable score for a bottom yeah, I mean, most people seem to have that one at the top. We'll see where it lands for me. My bottom 
might be a surprise because I do love Mr. Josh Homme, but I don't love Humbug. I think after the first two albums, they kind of are missing a sound. They don't really know what they're going for. So they're kind of just throwing darts at a dartboard. It's like a stoner rock, a mm, little surf rock, a mm, little Brit pop. And on Humbug, you know, it's an interesting turn, I guess. But it's just not cohesive. I don't think Alex Turner has found his next like lyrical set yet. Like he was really good early on, just sh- doing those little vignettes of you know going to the bar, going to the discotheque, going to the pub, chasing the birds around. Uh, a very clever little sharp observations. Here, I don't know. I, he just doesn't seem to have any like anchor and uh you know it's a little more lumbering i think it's a good precursor to the sound that they'll get on am that sort of weird combo of like the real bass heavy just real hard riffs and turner's uh nimble lyricism but here you know it kind of trades the the literal you know the first couple albums is very like england centered like you could kind of you know you got a good sketch of what was going on Here's a little more metaphysical. The youthful energy isn't quite there. Uh, I think there's some decent tracks. My Propeller, Crying Lightning are good heavy rockers. A little more groove, I think, than their first couple albums. Dangerous Animals kind of is probably their most Queens of the Stone Age sounding song. And I really do like Ocean Approaching. It has a dark, like, carnivalesque Doors vibe to it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't hate it i don't dislike it I, I think it's decent but it's the one i just didn't come back to very often probably just their weakest set of songs in my opinion so uh, a mid a low to mid three and a half stars for for humbug it's, it's definitely listenable it's just in comparison to their other stuff i don't dig it that much all right i can see that i guess my number six is favorite worst nightmare the second record not a huge change up from the debut, but I do think the production's a little better. It's a little bit of a fuller sound. I think the guitar tones are better. I think there's a little more depth to the mix, a little more low end. And even though they were very energetic on the debut, I think it comes across a little bit more on this record. It's a little more aggressive and a little more sneering. Uh, Teddy Picker's really cool. Fluorescent Adolescent, I think, is pretty strong. Only One Who Knows is better than the similar soft tunes like Riot Van that, that are on the debut. I think the drumming and the bass playing stand out uh, a lot more on this record than they do on the debut. I, th- I think it's still a little overhyped. And I think that this type of rock, which... I think was pretty prevalent and coming out of the UK a lot from like the late nineties through, you know, this, the start of this era of the band Um, that this type of rock, that's very like, I guess it riff based is kind of what's happening. The songs are kind of written around these like riffs and grooves more so than like chord changes and melodies is not my favorite style of writing, but I do think it's an improvement in most measurable ways. I think the songs are better. It sounds better. And I I seem to recall at the time people not liking this much. Looking back now at reviews and stuff, it seems like kind of mostly favorable, but that is not the feeling I remember floating around at the time. I, I feel like people were disappointed with this. And I think maybe that's why they kind of searched for a little while, went through that phase with Humbug looking for a different sound because... I think they got um, raked over the coals a little for for repeating the debut so closely, but I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. That's just my memory of things. Um, this is three stars as well, but it's a pretty high three stars. All right, that makes sense. If that one's coming after the, the debut, they are a little similar there. My number six is going to be Suck It and See, which is not dirty at all. It just means try it. Which is a, you know, it's just something the British say, one of their wacky phrases. And I tried it, and I thought it was just okay. Again, that's kind of in this black hole in the middle of the discography where they don't know what they're doing. 
This one's all over the place again, like Humbug, but I, I think it just has better songwriting. And this one had a little uh, happier, a little more upbeat. Uh, Black Treacles, pretty good. A nice peppy bass line. She's Thunderstorm sounds, to me anyway, exactly like an Oasis track. It's just completely steeped in the Britpop tradition. Uh, Brick by Brick sounds like Queens of the Stone Age. All My Own Stunts is cool. It's like Smiths meets The Cure. Nice and jangly. One of the few jangly uh, tracks that they do. Power Driver Waltz, I think, leans a little bit towards what they'll do on AM and Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino. And Second and Seas, another wonderful little jangle pop number, very bright and buoyant. And it's an interesting mix of styles, but I don't think the lyrics are sharp. And I think they're either too vague or he's just trying a little bit too hard to be clever. It just isn't natural. It's not like those pithy observations, the vignettes, like the first couple of albums from Turner. And I don't know, it just seems like it's just like kind of some of these words are just picked out of a dictionary just to like sound more important than they are. I don't know, it just... I like their other eras much better than this kind of middle middle section. I like the lounge pop. I like the dark AM. And I like their early stuff. And these middle ones are, are fine. But this is another three and a half stars. Just It doesn't stick. They don't have that sound. They're just bouncing around a little too much. And the songs are, are decent, but just uh, not my favorite stuff. So. A high three and a half for suck it and see. All right. Well, I like that one a lot. Uh, my number five is AM. And this is another one where the mat, it's just like the massiveness of how big this record got is just so baffling to me. It makes no sense. Like they see, they were on like this downward trajectory and all of a sudden this record comes along and it's like the biggest thing in the world. This is a weird record. I think the songwriting is very strong, lyrically especially. I think, um, at least to date, this was the, the best writing he had done. Um, I think the lyrics are really good on this record. But I was a little, I'm a little disappointed in this record, like the way they went back to the kind of desert rock riffage. And then that combined with the Black Keys esque production, uh, I am not really a fan of. Um, I think the songs are really good. There's some really memorable hooks. Like I said, the lyrics are great, but the sound of this record is just like the least interesting thing imaginable to me. I think it sounds so boring, just like corporate commercial rock for truck commercials. Yeah, I kind of like the music, but the sound of it is just dull. And I hear people cover these songs, especially thinking of churches doing Do I Want to Know? And it's just like, damn, what a great song. It's so well written. And yeah, their presentation of these songs is just kind of dull and gray to me. I do think the songs are pretty good, though, so I'll go very light 3.5 on this. I also like number one party anthem a lot. I think that one is like the track that's kind of pointing the way forward into their next phase a little bit, uh, get, getting a little of that lounginess coming in on this record. But Overall, yeah, I don't know. Like, I th I do. I think the songs are all good, but I just don't like listening to the record that much. So, always comes down to production. That's, I think that's what I used to think. I thought it was a little dry and black easy, but I no longer think that. My number five, and this is a cool, this is a really cool record. Might be the coolest one in their whole catalog. It just kind of falls apart for me at the end. Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino is my number five. I'm going up to four stars. I love like everything about this album, the story behind it. You know, he's watching a lot of like sci-fi from back in the day. And he wanted to just like do this completely new thing, introduces a million new instruments into their repertoire. Um, I mean, there's a bajillion different types of things. Uh, what are this? It's like vintage synths and keyboards, organs, pianos, harpsichords, dulciola, orchestron, farfisa, RMI, rocks accord, 
baritone and lap steel guitars, uh, all the normal electric and acoustic guitars, a bunch of weird stuff like a rotary, timpani, vibraphones. Like he's going for this like big, just like full, amazing sound. And it starts off killer. I think star treatments, amazing. And he's got like this weird sci-fi, like David Bowie, Starman kind of lyrical bent on this. And he's bringing in like all sorts of like fame and like, it, it's weird. It's like happening on the moon uh, in the 70s and like David Bowie and, you know, Serge Gainsborough are there. And it's just really interesting, the whole thing. And the production is incredible on Star Treatment. Real 70s, cool almost like Philly soul, uh, amazing drum sound, just real snappy. And it's, you know, much weirder. Like it's not like AM at all. They could have just redone AM like four times and been the biggest rock band in the world. Um, but this one is just much weirder. It's much lusher stylistically, way different. Nothing like they'd done before. You know, the first first five albums really had kind of like this everyman appeal like very down to earth. And this one is just like, he's rocket off into the, the solar system. Uh, definitely get some Bowie, get some 70s soul, some, you know, Chris Mayfield and Tom Bell. There's a, a fair amount of crooniness here. So I don't think the car, like, I think everyone was kind of overly surprised by the car, but the car is really just the next step, like past what this album was doing and how Alex Turner was, uh, you know, approaching songwriting and, and what he was doing. And there's, I mean, there's just so much cool stuff. Love the fuzzed out guitar and golden trunks to open the song. She looks like fun is like a little, I don't know, Tom Waitsian, maybe a little Scott Walker in there. I think they throw in like the interpolation of Magical Mystery Tour a couple times. Some really cool, like 60s sounding guitar solos. And I think it's great up until the world's first ever monster truck front flip. Like four out of five golden trunks, Ricotti Base Hotel Casino, American Sports, one point perspective. That, that first half is amazing. And then it just kind of runs out of steam and doesn't know what to do with itself with the last five tracks. Um, you know, Bat Phone's cool. The Ultra Cheese is, is decent. But I was I was looking for like some like big like statement or, or ending at the end, and it kind of just you know repeats itself in diminishing returns. So I wanted to go higher because it is a really cool album, but uh, I'm I'm at four stars for Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino. Well, I'm surprised to see that so low from you. I thought that would be higher. Uh, my number four is Humbug. Uh, this one's a bit of a shakeup. Like I said, I, I feel like at the time they were being accused of repeating themselves with the with the uh, sophomore record. So Josh Homme comes in to produce. I think his influence is pretty clear all over this record. Uh, definitely brings more of that desert rock, stoner rock, whatever you want to call it. Darker, more mysterious sound. I kind of get what you're saying, uh, some of your criticisms of this, but I, I also think that them just kind of like slowing things down a little. I think in some ways that they do benefit from that. There, there's more space in the mix. It allows some of the songwriting and the lyrics especially to come forward. And I think it kind of works in the opposite way of the debut where I said I could, you know, pull a song from it and put it on a playlist. I think individually the songs here aren't super memorable and I don't think it's very like the tracks aren't very immediate and they're not that catchy or anything like that. But I think it does work a little better as a complete album listen. I think there's kind of a, a greater than the sum of its parts kind of thing happening here. Alex Turner has said that it's as important, if not more important than the first two albums and getting them to where they are now. And I think you can see that it's like, uh, I think their their current last couple records are are more similar to Humbug than they are to the debut uh, you can hear him changing his vocal delivery on this record, starting a little bit more of the crooning style that he'd use heavily on sub subsequent records. And I, I think there are some good songs. You, you have to be a little more patient with them, but My Propeller is really cool. Cornerstone, I think, is great. Um, so three and a half for Humbug. Yeah. 
My number four, I'm going to go with AM. And I guess I understand the criticism because it does have a very, like, distinct, obvious production to it. And, like, it is, it's a little dry and it's kind of sparse. And everything is just based on those, like, huge, all devouring, world devouring riffs. But I, I've kind of turned, I, I sort of dismissed this album in the past. I just thought it was the hits and nothing else. But now I think it's pretty damn good. I mean, do I want to know? I think is just one of the best rock songs of the decade. Uh, just the way it comes in, just very meticulous and just dun, dun, dun throughout. It's a great riff. I love the way that the guitar comes in at the end, very urgent sounding. And I think this was the sound. They needed some sound to anchor the, the record, to anchor their style. And I think this is the, the sound that works for them. And I think they just killed it going for this sound. I think they could have gone in a bunch of different directions after Suck It and See. But they really honed in on those just monster riffs I think it really worked out. Uh, you know, he's back to kind of being this cheeky, you know, why you only call me when you're high? Are you mine? You know, the, the give and the take, the eternal dance between man and woman, etc. cetera. Uh, he, he's singing about parties and coupling and courtship, but in a little more mature way. It's not quite as like, you know, you want to have a shag, etc. You want to hit the discotheque, grab a pint of those first couple albums. And, you know, he's, what, like, early 30s here? So he's always kind of sounded older uh, after that first album where he sounds like a teenager. But now he's kind of getting into adulthood. And uh, I think the songs just really serve, you know, even the, the the big riffs and everything, they really are a vessel to serve Turner's hypnotic vocals for most of it. Uh, he really is the focus. It really is all about Alex Turner at this point. Uh, you miss like a little bit of that grimy, nervous energy of the first two albums, but this is, you know, this is middle age. Band adapts well. You know, it's it's a classier version of those early albums. I think Arabella hits really hard. I feel like bands like Royal Blood, like all those kind of like real riff rockers that came after Worth were just like born from the the goo and the blackness of that uh, heavy sledgehammer riff. There's big explosions of guitar. It's the confident groove in it. Number one party anthem, kind of Beatles-y, which is nice. Got that croon in there. Love Fireside's unique groove, those tribal sounding drums. Pretty percolating. You know, I just think it's a really great selection of songs. If you don't like what it sounds like, that's that's fine, I guess. But I think this was the right direction. Alex Turner found his groove. He found his lyrical, you know, whatever, muse again. I think it's darn good. I'm not going to go four and a half, but it's a, a high four stars for me. Right. My number three is Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino. A very uh, divisive change in direction for them, especially I, I've definitely heard of, you know, people that were huge fans of the early, you know, energetic, spunky, brash early records. And then suddenly that band is doing very lush and loungy 70s kind of soft rock, space rock stuff. Um, so I've definitely heard of people saying they were turned off by this, but also I've also seen glowing reviews for this record and know some people that love it. I think it's cool. I, this is probably more my speed than the early stuff. Alex Turner started writing on piano a lot more, I think, for the first time. And, and I think that really just opens things up for his writing. I like the solo on One Point Perspective a lot. Some of my favorite guitar playing in their entire catalog. I love that guitar sound. Um, and, and I just, I don't think there would have been room in their music for that, especially on the first two records, but really until this point, I don't think there was much room for that kind of arranging and that type of a guitar solo. I think the lyrics are getting really clever, really interesting. They're engaging. They kind of make you lean in and pay attention. The record could be a little melodically, and I agree with you. Near the back half of this record, it feels like 
okay, we've heard this, let's wrap it up. And the car, I think being a similar record to this, um, I have ahead of it, obviously, because I, I just think there's more variety in that record and they do a better job of mixing things up and finding different things within this sound. This whole record is a little bit one note. Um, so that was my, that, that would be my kind of criticism of it. But overall, I think the arrangements are really good. The recording is really warm and lush. I dig the loungy kind of, you know, James Bond-esque coolness to it. It's really stylized. And uh, yeah, I think the songs overall are, are just really good. So three, uh, yeah, three and a half stars for Tranquility Base Hotel and Casino. Cool. All right. My number three album I didn't like when it came out, but now I really think it's great. Uh, whatever you say I am, that's what I'm not. Is my number three. They debut. I don't know. I guess I was just too cool for this kind of music back when it came out in 2006, I guess, whenever it was. And I'm, like, I'm trying to figure out why I wouldn't have liked this when I heard it. Maybe I just was listening on the wrong speakers or just not paying attention. Because I just think it's, you know, grimy, absolute blast. It's got the requisite punk and garage rock spirit, just these buzzsaw riffs, this just like whatever attitude, just toss off. Alex Turner, really mature and immature songwriting at the same time. Alex Turner singing about the British youth and club culture and getting pissed and tossing off and schmorking the whatever, all those British phrases. And uh, I, I just think it's it's great. There's so much energy. It feels alive and vital and powerful. Totally non-judgmental. Uh, just like clever, interesting observations and characters all over the place. I think Bet You Look Good on the Dance Floor. Man, I can't believe I didn't like this song. It's so good. The lyrics are so cheeky. They're so clever. I uh, love the shouty backing vocals. The dancing to electro pop like a robot from 1984. I mean, these lyrics are really good for, what, 19, I think they were when he wrote this or when it came out. Oh, there ain't no love, no Montagues or Capulets, just banging tunes and DJ sets. Like That's that's really good. That's really clever. Uh, and Dirty Dance Floors and Dreams of Naughtiness. Um, great stuff. Fake Tales of San Francisco is great. Just a, kind of a backhand to the fake uh, sort of scene stirs. Love dancing shoes, that weighty bass line just crashes it straight into the dance floor. And uh, I really like Alex Turner's vocals, like that motor mouth style, like half rapping sometimes, just shouty, great bass lines, great drums throughout. Uh, I think a certain romance is the perfect closer, kind of slower, real summation of, of everything that Turner's sung about and kind of the whole culture, what was going on at the time. This is, you know, this is the party, the night out. I think they really do a good job with their next album on kind of the morning after and consequences and stuff. But talk about that maybe next, maybe not. We'll see. Yeah, going to be interesting. I can't imagine you not going the car number one. In which case, if you do, we will have a first ever bifecta because my number two is Suck It and See. This record, I think, after Humbug is kind of like another course correction. I think this is a much lighter affair than Humbug before it, which had this real kind of darkness hanging over it. Right out of the gate, she's Thunderstorms, probably my favorite uh, Arctic Monkey song to this point in their career, and maybe entirely. You'll have to watch top 10 songs for that, but I think that's a great song. I do see, uh, uh, you mentioned Oasis. I can definitely see kind of like a, a Brit rock thing. Uh, they're pulling all kinds of stuff into their sound here. A little country, a little surf, a little glam. The songs are less built upon riffs, and I think that really helps make room for stronger vocal melodies. I think this is probably, this record's probably got some of their catchiest uh, melodies. The Hellcat Spangled Sha La 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 La. Uh, Reckless Serenade, Pile Driver, Waltz are all very tuneful songs. Uh, and they're all closer to like the classic style of songwriting that I like. Um, so yeah, I, I gravitate towards this one. I liked it when it came out. I listened to it a, a bit that year and haven't really listened to it since. Uh, usually see this record placed pretty low 
last or second to last when people rank their records. And I kind of understand why, but I also don't. I think it's probably, as you mentioned, it's it's not that they don't have a sound on this record, but I think this record is probably their least stylized where like they have hyper specific sounds on all of the other records. And this one is a little broader and a little like pulling from uh, like multiple places and trying different things uh, track to track. I don't necessarily see that as a detriment. I think it is probably their most varied record. And and um, I think other records like Tranquility Bass uh, suffer actually from being too samey throughout. So yeah, it's cool. I think the songs are good. And that's really all, all there is to it. I think it's just got their most tuneful stuff. Uh, so... I this is like right on the cusp of four. Probably should stay three point five. It's a very high three point five. Well, hold out hope for the car then. My number two favorite worst nightmare is my number two. I almost put it at number one for a, a brief moment because I listened to it a ton this week or past couple of weeks or however long we've been holding out on the Arctic Monkeys. And it really just struck me how good it sounded, how cool it was. It's got that, you know, energy and just like speed and of the first album. It just kind of cranks it up even more. Um, the they switched bass players, but they brought in Nick O'Malley, and he just absolutely kills it on this album. And whatever Matt Helders was doing on this album, the drummer. Uh, just every track has a really just amazing, speedy, powerful drums. It's great. There's, you know, there's like a little, I don't want to say post-punk because I don't like post-punk, but um, it, it's got like just a little extra something, a little more darkness uh, uh, than the first track of, or the first album. First album is very kind of like upbeat and kind of like, you know, cheeky, I'll say. This one is like the the next day, the consequences of all the partying. Uh, it's definitely darker. And um, it kicks off with Brainstorm, which is just absolutely lightning, punky thriller. Um, Teddy Picker has a little bit of like Brit pop in it, but still got a really good rusty guitar line. Balaclava, tons of nervous energy. Uh, they, they throw in a couple heartfelt pop songs. And the first album the heartfelt pop song was riot van which was about you know riot police coming to break up you know a, a fight or whatever on this one it feels like heartbreak and regret and a, a little more of that maturity coming through turner still a good lyricist great lyricist i'll say but he, he's, he's bringing in a little more um of that regret that you know growing up a little bit here i uh, love that spindly guitar and old yellow bricks um you know, it's it's a prickly album it's almost angular it's twitchy and nervous uh fluorescent adolescent has a little bit of that pulp in it i think a little jarvis cocker uh, a little crude a little naughty tinged with regret uh do me a favors you know more adult problems and concerns kind of creeping into the adolescent ramblings and five of five Killer cut, wistful nostalgia, spilling into angry, drunken regret. And, uh, you know, I just think it trades in some of the juvenilia, the first album, but more of that maturity, regret, looking back, the adult problems. Club kids are starting to outgrow the clubs, different vibe. But I think Turner does a really good job of making it all feel real. And the band still just kicks ass and drumming, amazing, great work, uh, great riffs and a really wide range of sounds so it's it's real good it almost overtook the car but i can't get rid of my my love for the car it's it's my baby well we agree on that maybe cram's leaving is going to draw us closer together <laughs> perhaps um my number one is the car they wanted to make a louder, more guitar-focused record after Tranquility Bass, but that is not where the songs wanted to go, and that is not what happened at all. So 
The car very much, I think, in the vein of Tranquility Bass. There's maybe even more orchestration and strings on this record than there are on, on the previous record. Uh, there better be a mirror ball and big ideas, especially are extremely arranged and extremely orchestrated. I also think of the two records, uh, this one has the stronger melodies and greater variety. Kind of already explained why I like this record more than some of the other ones in my other reviews. I Ain't Quite Where I Think I Am uh, has a bit of like a, a funk soul sound to it. So does Jet Skis on the Moat. Uh, Sculptures of Anything Goes is really dark and brooding. It's got distorted percussion sounds and deep synths. Hello You uh, is a bit different too than the other tracks with a little bit of like an indie pop synth line at the beginning and swirling strings and fuzzed, uh, fuzzed out wah guitar. Mr. Schwartz is an acoustic track, kind of vaguely bossa nova inspired, it sounds like. Um, so yeah, just a lot of different stuff going on. It's that sound that I, I really liked and gravitated towards on the, the previous record, but just uh, I think they find a little more to do with that sound on this record, and I, I just think they made better songs, better record. Lyrically really strong. I just dig dig the whole thing. So yes, four stars for the car. Yeah, I love the car. It was four and a half stars for me. It was my number two from last year. Only being held to the top spot by Always, which, I mean, it's impossible. It's like going up against Thriller or something huge, at least in my world. Um, you know, I think Turner kind of just builds on what he was doing on Tranquility Base Hotel and, and Casino. Uh, you know, I get a lot of like Scott Walker minus the Cavalry Charge and Jacques Brel songs. These songs kind of just unfold. They're very cinematic. There's not a ton of you know choruses, not a ton of repeated anything. It just kind of just winds its way. You know, you're you're always waiting for that big chorus to just knock you on there. Better be a mirror ball, but it kind of just like slowly bludgeons you to death with this like loungy, just measured groove that just keeps going. Uh, they take their time getting to their hooks. It's a journey. Like I said, it's, it's it's very cinematic sounding. Sculptures of Anything Goes channels Hans Zimmer with those huge synth uh, robotic drums, just that that you'd hear in uh, the trailer for Inception, just like just you know, quick cuts, just giant synths. But they switch it up, you know, jet skis on the moats, uh, throws in some of that supple wah guitar. Uh, just real sensual, rich sounding song. Feels aristocratic, you know, white marble, like expensive villas in Italy. Like the, the lyrics and the sound just like transport you to all these different but wealthy places. You know, body paint. One of my favorite songs of the, you know, many past years. Again, you know, there's models and there's just opulence and decadence all over the place. Uh, and the music is rich and vibrant and all these perfect little details, the, the strings and the, the piano, the, the pauses and the hesitation and, and all this stuff that you don't really find uh, in pop and rock very often. And then it closes with this great fuzzy guitar solo. So you're still getting, you know, the band is diminished, maybe a little more than they should be because they're all excellent players. But, you know, if you really dial in and listen, like there's some real cool guitar parts. The drums are great. Bass, maybe you don't hear very much, but uh, you know, somebody, somebody's got to suffer, and it's usually the bass player, right? I think it ends strongly. People say they don't like the second half, but I think the car and big ideas are great moody things. Uh, Hello You has got another bit of like the Tom Bell and Curtis Mayfield soul R&B of the early 70s. I just love the way that they've gone from this like juvenile you know, punk dance band into this like lounge, you know, just grandeur loving uh, lounge pop band, sleek, sophisticated soul and and rock. And there's no way anyone could have seen this coming back in 2006. But uh, I think they all pulled off. Uh, Turner's a great vocalist and lyricist and it just feels natural. It feels like a just, a, you know, a journey from that band to this band and you know, all the detours along the way, but it feels like the the perfect endpoint for a, a band like them. So I'm I'm at four and a half stars. I never get to five with this band, but 
I really thought uh, this week was great, and I very much enjoyed all of these records. All right. Yeah. Um, let us know what you think of our list. Let us know what you think of Arctic Monkeys. Hit the like button, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, check back. We'll be doing our top 10 songs as well. Um, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Mm-hmm.